The following is a clip from Primo Radical Uncensored. To watch the full one-hour interview, please go to rockfin.com slash Primo Radical and sign up to become a premium member. So getting back to Assange, uh, I know recently, you know, there were some developments in his case where he may end up getting extradited or finally pushing ahead with that. Um, I was just wondering if you could kind of update us on what is happening with Assange's case. And then also, again, if there are any major demonstrations or, or anything else that's being planned to show solidarity with Assange. Okay, so um, I, I don't really know how far back you want me to go in terms of updates. I guess I could just start with... Uh, um, uh, they, it, the high court, uh, you know, denied, uh, or uh, went ahead with the extradition that, uh, then kicked it back to the district court. They reached out to the Supreme court. Um, and so in the UK, you have to request an appeal from the Supreme court, and then they decide whether or not your, your case is worthy of an appeal. They decide they declined to hear the appeal. So the Supreme court in the UK declined to hear the appeal, um, from the Assange team. Um, uh, and so that kicked it back to the district court, which is the same court that, initially ruled against extradition in January of 2020. Um, and that was basically just procedural. That was that once it, once the Supreme court denies it, they have to kick it back to the district judge who then sends it on to UK home secretary, pretty Patel. So that's who, uh, it is on her desk as of this moment. Um, it was presented to her on April 20th. Uh, she had to allow for 28 days from that date to, um, give the Assange defense time to make their submissions to her. Um, so basically they were just going to submit things to try to influence her decision, uh, to try to appeal to, <laughs> Her, her common sense. I mean, listen, she's very corrupt. Let's be very clear. Um, she's very corrupt. It's uh, This is not looking good for us. I, I, I just want to be honest with people. It's not looking good. Um, but uh, so it's now sitting on her desk and she has um, until uh, June. Oh, hold on. I just asked Stella and my brain just froze. Um, she has, so it's two months from the April uh, 20th date. I think it's June 19th. Uh, is the uh, supposed, that's the um, statutory deadline. So Stella said the statutory deadline is two months from the 20th of April. And so um, uh, that means that she, uh, she, she she's, had, she's gotten their submissions, their representations, uh, trying to influence her decision. She has to consider those and respond in writing, accepting or rejecting them. Uh, the two, mo two months expires on the 19th of June, but she can, here's the kicker, she can extend that time period if she feels necessary. So once again... <laughs> We're going to see this dragged out for as long as humanly possible. That's par for the course throughout this entire case, everything. And this is intentional uh, for people who aren't aware uh, in the global intelligence files that WikiLeaks released. Uh, there are emails from uh, Stratfor. Um, and in those emails, um, they are discussing the different ways in which they could handle or deal with Julian Assange. And one of the ways that they discussed was to tie him up in legal stuff for the next 25 years. And here we are. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's um, been over three years now, right? Uh, it's been over. I mean, really, it's been 12 years. Um, yeah. he, he's been illegally and arbitrarily detained for, you know, over a decade. Uh, but he has, yes, in Belmarsh, he's been in Belmarsh for over three years now. And this portion of the, the fight has been going on for more than three years. And at every, at, at every step, it has been dragged out. It's always dragged out to the very last possible minute. Uh, if there are extensions that can be, uh, made, they do that. It's, it's like a constant, uh, we're, we're in a constant state of limbo. We know, and that's, that's the real thing is that we never really know um, when anything is happening. There's never any like specified date. So it's, we're in a constant state of scramble trying to figure out, you know, how to, you know, combat this stuff and effectively organize against it, which is difficult when you don't know what's going on ever. Um, so as far as demonstrations and stuff, so Julian Assange's 51st, 51st birthday is on um, actually July 3rd. Um, so um uh, there are a multitude of different uh, global protests, Berlin, um, uh, Italy, London, obviously, uh, Canberra and Australia. Um, uh, there will probably be something in D.C. Uh, so the best place, if people want to know um, at any time if there are, are events happening globally, and this, I mean, really globally, my friend Alex runs the Candles for Assange Twitter page, which is Candles, the number four Assange, um, and she is amazing. She has kind of taken it upon herself to find out about all of these protests from around the world and kind of bring them all together under one Twitter account. She makes different um, images or graphics for each event. So they're all cohesive uh, and she tweets them out regularly. So she's constantly updating anytime that there's uh, any kind of uh, actions or anything like that happening all around the world. Hmm. So just to take a step back to the, the case for a minute, just so I understand the process of what happened. So 
Uh, initially, the, the district court did rule that he should not be extradited because uh, he may be subject to uh, cruel and unusual punishment effectively, right, in, in the U.S.? Yeah. And then was it that the U.S. appealed that decision and said that he would not be, and then the U.K. court changed their mind? Is that what happened? Yes. Okay, so on January 4th, 2020, Judge District Judge Vanessa Baritzer ruled against extradition based solely on uh, his mental health and the oppressive conditions of the United States prison system. Um, and so uh, immediately following that, the United States appealed that decision and they uh, submitted assurances. <laughs> they gave their assurances that they promised they promise they're going to be nice to Julian Assange. They promise. Um, however, these assurances are absolute garbage for a multitude of reasons. Um, but one of them being that uh, in in the actual uh, uh, the wording of it, they give themselves kind of a backdoor, out, like an out. Um, you know, so they in it it says, and I'm definitely paraphrasing here because it's in like legalese. Um, but they, you know, uh, if, if Julian Assange says or does anything that they deem to be a threat to quote unquote national security, then they can decide to because basically what it was that they were they were um assuring everybody that he would not be put under sams which is special administrative measures which is hell on earth essentially you're thrown into a a, a cell and forgotten about it's um uh, it's you know definitely the worst of solitary confinement uh you're everything you're very restricted on everything visits phone calls mail um you don't speak to other prisoners the guards are actually trained to not converse with you uh it is horrendous um so that was what they were promising to not do um but they again they gave themselves the back door and said that if he does anything that they claim to be a threat to national security or whatever if he makes a statement uh, or whatever uh they can they can kind of go back on that and put him under sams they can also um uh just throw him under a cmu which is what daniel hale's being held in and that's a communications management unit uh that was an invention post the war on terror uh they just rebranded special administrative measures basically it's the same thing um so they can also do that and kind of get that's the kind of their way around it um so uh yeah they uh, they judge Vanessa Baritza ruled against his extradition based on the mental health aspect uh the United States then appealed uh and made a lot of promises that they would uh be nice to him uh but you know this is also the country that was just revealed to have been plotting to murder him so it's kind of right. hard for me to take them seriously <laughs> so if he does get extradited to the U.S., do you think that there would be a larger public backlash? And again, oh. I know that most people in the U.S. probably don't even really know who Assange is necessarily, or I would say the majority probably definitely do not know uh, yeah. why he's being prosecuted. I think like if you did one of those things where you just ask people on the street, um, the people that did know who he was would probably think it was because of the 2016 election. Yeah. Um, but again, like if there if he was brought here because there are protests happening here, like and there are more people in the US than the UK, don't you don't you feel as though there would be uh, just, you know, lar larger outcry or be like more uh, at least in their face or more well publicized? Or do you, again, just think that because people are generally apathetic that uh, they could just continue rolling on with with this um, prosecution and, and torture of Assange? Again, that's really hard to answer because I go both ways. Like there are days where I'm very hopeful and I think surely if they bring him here, people will be uh, uh, angry about that. It will be much easier for us to get people involved. But then on the other hand, there are days where I think uh, nobody cares. No, I mean, nobody cares. I, I, we've been screaming about it for years. We've been trying to get people uh, to realize what's happening. Uh, and it's uh, it, a lot of people are just, as you said, very apathetic, um, which I understand. I mean, listen, I, I don't mean that to like be... Um, you know, critical or condescending, I guess maybe a little critical, but I don't mean that to be uh, condescending in any way. I understand people are incredibly busy. They're just trying to survive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody's got two or three jobs. Um, you know, they have to take their kids to practice and they have to mow their grass and go grocery shopping. And it's really difficult. And in particular in this country where um, uh, the mainstream media does not talk about this at all, it is very difficult for anybody, as you said, to even be made aware of it. Most people, in my experience, there are one of two people, people who have never heard of Julian Assange or people who hate him and they can't really articulate why. Those are generally, I mean, obviously there's, uh, you know, other kinds, but that's uh, the two biggest groups of people that I deal with. Um, and so, I mean, then that's what we're up against. The, the media blackout and just getting the information out there is really like the hardest battle. It is so difficult. Um, I mean, even, and I'm sure that you've seen me on Twitter, even getting independent media to cover Julian Assange is like pulling teeth. It is unbelievably difficult. 
for me to get anybody to talk about this thing. Um, and it's, uh, you know, for a multitude of reasons. I mean, a lot of independent content creators are afraid to cover Julian Assange because their channels will be shadow banned. It will kind of put you on a radar. You're, you're definitely not going to get monetized on that video. Uh, you might lose subscribers. You might not, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. a lot of people, and we've had people straight up tell us that that's why they won't cover it. Um, but yeah, it's really difficult even just to get the information out there. So um, I, I would like to believe that if he were brought here, that that would increase the level of urgency um but i i'm not convinced of that entirely uh if i didn't have like a little tiny bit of hope in my cold otherwise cold dead heart i wouldn't continue doing what i do but it's it, it is a real struggle it's a real struggle hmm. well who do you think has been the most effective of uh, spreading the message about this because um you know i would i would think roger waters and he actually has yeah. a, a tour currently so i have to imagine that he's going to be making some kind of statements during those concerts um, but besides besides Roger Waters, who else do you think has really been at the forefront of letting people know what's happening with Julian Assange? Um, I would say Stella's very effective, obviously. I think that um, she's very, uh, uh, the way that she's able to articulate the personal side of things, being his wife and the mother of his two kids, I think that that's a really effective uh, a way to get people to start to see Julian as a human again, because they've really dehumanized him in the media. Uh, again, like I said, they've kind of made a, a, a comic book villain out of this guy. Um, so Which is ironic like, too, because he he was like something of a hero, at least yes. briefly. Like he, you know, he'd go on real time with Bill Maher, for example. Yeah. And then I, again, I think it was really the 2016 election that just completely turned liberals absolutely against him. Yes. And that's, uh, you know, people always say that he's a partisan hack and he helped trunk it. He also, uh, people forget he, he's, he's exposed all of them, all of them, uh, all of them, you know what I mean? And not just the United States. I think a lot of people need to realize too, that he's uh, exposed countries across the globe, including Russia uh, and corporations for their misconduct and their criminality. Um, so yeah, it is, uh, you're right. I mean, it, there was a time, I think it was in 2010 or something. He gave a Ted talk in a room full of liberals and they gave him a standing ovation. <laughs> and now he is like public enemy number one because he, uh, you know, uh, hurt Hillary Clinton and he damaged her, uh, in the ability for her to become president, um, which is unfortunate. There is a, re a really big partisan aspect and a real tribalistic aspect to that. Um, but yeah, I would say Stella is very effective for obvious reasons. I think Craig Murray is brilliant. Um, he is a, a, an amazing writer and on his blog post, he has done a fantastic job of covering this um, from start to finish. Um, there are a lot of great journalists. Uh, Kevin Gastola is a great example. Mohamed al uh Stefania Maruzzi uh, from Italy. She's uh, her uh, her book in English will be out. I think, I think this year, end of this year maybe. Um, but she's uh, been a, a, in a battle, like a monumental battle for years, dealing with FOIA requests, trying to get information about the Assange case um, and how it was handled. So she has been like at the forefront of that fight. Um, so yeah, I think uh, obviously Roger Waters is probably one of the most effective people just based on the fact that he does have such a, a big platform. Um, but yeah, I think Stella, Craig, John Pilger, I think does a great job. Um, you know, uh, Matt Kennard, who uh, is at Declassified UK, uh, he does great work. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of people. I hate naming people off because I always forget people, but <laughs> yeah, I think that the London crew, the entire London crew of activists, um, every single Wednesday, they are at Australia House, um, which is essentially like an embassy in the UK. Um, every single Saturday, they are in Piccadilly or at Piccadilly Circle. Um, and that's rain, shine, COVID, doesn't matter. They are out there every single week, twice a week, uh, you know, doing everything that they can. So, I mean, there's, and there's a lot of activist groups all around that are doing, I mean, in Germany, they have weekly events. Boston, and I think does bi-weekly events. Um, there's a lot of really amazing people trying to get the word out. Um, and we just need more. <laughs> we need more. So again, if they brought him to the U.S., I think that the U.S. media would have to cover it more because it, it was happening here as opposed to in the U.K. And, uh, you know, again, you know, what, what we've struggled with is, uh, or what I've struggled with is just trying to understand the mindset of, of journalists, so-called journalists who have not covered this or... <laughs> Um, you know, not, not uh, been worried about. <laughs> um, and again, I know that most people in the corporate media really are hacks and they really are propagandists and they're really just in it for the, the paycheck and the, the access and being part of, of like the, the elite circle. Um, but at the same time, like I have to imagine that the, like the, the motivating factor for these folks to be in journalism had to at least be partly to expose the truth and speak truth to power. Um, 
so you know, I just wonder if this was if this was brought to the U.S. Do you think that there would be any more uh, journalists in the U.S. or you know people that work in the corporate media who may be more outspoken or more critical of of the prosecution? Probably not. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> uh, that's really really sad to say, but I think that they have their marching orders. I think that they're not going to talk about or cover anything. Um, out, they're not going to speak outside the lines, and they're not. Uh, I, I think that it's not permitted to speak in defense of Julian Assange. Uh, I mean, it, I I talk about this all the time because it's it should be a very like people should be uh, uh, raising their eyebrows to the fact that the mainstream press isn't covering what's happening to Julian Assange. Not just because it's the greatest threat to the future of their profession, if you want to call them journalists. Not just because of that. It's a story. Dude, it's a story. I mean, this has everything that people would be at. I mean, it's like a movie, right? It's yep. got espionage and sex and, you know, all of the stuff that makes like a major story. Uh, and the fact that they're not covering it is very strange. I mean, it's a historical court case on press freedom. It's a really like juicy, deep story. Um, and so the idea that nobody's talking about it is very strange. Um, and I just don't think that there's ever going to be any incentive for them uh, to cover this thing in a legitimate way. Will there be more coverage of it? Probably. But will it be skewed heavily? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it will just be like uh, the you know, last 10 minutes of the newscast where the majority is focusing on guns or abortion or monkeypox or whatever the crisis du jour is. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be like a very, it'll be like a passing mention. Uh, you know, you might get like four minutes or something out of uh, Chris Hayes. Um, and, you know, they have done uh, some coverage of it before where they talk about the threats to press freedom and they may do that kind of stuff again. It's like how Chris Hayes every like four years is allowed to do seven minutes on Yemen. Every once in a while, they'll, they'll let you so that, and really they do that just so they can say, see, we covered it. Um, so, but yeah, I would say that it's very unlikely that I just, I, we cannot depend on mainstream press, the corporate media uh, to cover this thing in a very real way. Um, and that's, it leaves it to us. I mean, it leaves us, it leaves it to the people who care about this and who care about uh, free speech uh, mm. to try to get the information out, which is hard. I mean, again, it's hard. There's censorship, there's shadow banning, there's, I mean, it, algorithms, there's all of that stuff that we're contending uh, with. And so, but I mean, that it really, it is just up to us. And I, I think the in-person demonstrations is really what it's going to come down to. Because again, that's like what turned the tide against uh, the Iraq war and you know, going back for the, the Vietnam war. Um, the, the media just won't cover things. And again, like you're saying, the, the uh, so social media giants will just censor things or pretend that it's not happening. So it really does, you know, it's going to take people getting out in the streets and, and being uh, part of an actual movement. Yeah. Um, so Missy, I do have uh, a couple of uh, uh, patron questions if you have some time. Yeah, of course. So the first one is from John McCarthy in Chicago. John writes, are you familiar with the congressional candidate, Jeff Young? his opposition to the war uh, with Russia and the way some of the local Democratic Party leadership is treating him? Um, I think I have heard of him. I think somebody was trying to get Jimmy Dore maybe to talk to him or something. Um, I'm not super familiar with him. I'm not like, a, I don't know his platform or anything like that. Uh, I, I do believe he's running as a Democrat, <laughs> which is you know, uh, and I'm not, I mean, I, it, it, just being honest with everybody, uh, with, I think it was John that asked the question. I'm not, I don't do electoral politics. It's not something I have any interest in whatsoever. I don't think that there's any opportunity for legitimate change there. Mm. Um, but you know, uh, uh, if John wants to help in the wars and, or uh, Jeff, yeah. Jeff wants to help end the wars, um, or if Jeff wants to help me free Julian Assange, I'll totally work with them. Uh, I just don't pay much attention to electoral politics. Mm. Yeah, I actually, I, I had Jeff on the show and uh, he, uh, it's it's an interesting story where I, I had him before uh, he won the primary and, you know, I, I honestly didn't think he was going to win the primary. He's kind of like this perennial candidate, like he's run with the Green Party. I believe he may have run as a Republican at one point, um, but he really, like his main, the main thing he's running on is the is the, our war with Russia, is, is the proxy war. Um, and he did end up winning the, the nomination for the Democratic Party's, uh, he's the Democratic Party's nominee for the 6th Congressional District in Kentucky. Um, but because of his Is that a platform, red district, I would imagine, being in Kentucky? Yeah, there's an, there's an incumbent Republican. I think it's, you know, fairly competitive. I don't know if it's completely one-sided. But um, what's interesting is that the Democratic Party in Kentucky is, is completely throwing him under the bus, effectively surrendering the seat to the Republican because they don't want him to, to you know, they don't want him as the nominee. They don't want him to, to get elected. 
not the first time they've done it, and they'll continue to do that. If you don't go, if you don't tow the party line, uh, it doesn't matter. They, that's what's so funny is they preach vote blue no matter who to us, but yeah, they're right? not vote blue no matter who. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's yeah. they only say that to, to leftists to get them to, yes, to vote for to the, fall in the line, centrist, the corporatists. Yeah. But if, exactly. if somehow miraculously a Jeff Young <laughs> wins a primary, they just completely throw him under the bus. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think I actually had a similar question. Um, yeah, what what is your position on the corporate duopoly and the effectiveness of electoral politics? Do you support a working class movement instead of how instead, and how can we successfully overcome the cacophony of propaganda from mainstream media? Ooh, that's a big old loaded question. Yeah, it's kind so of obviously, a couple questions. <laughs> yeah, that is a couple. Okay, so obviously I just said I don't electoral politics for me, and I'm not. I, uh, I, I'll say this again. I don't, um, I, I'm not like going to discourage somebody for, if that's the way that you think you can make the most change. I, I'm, I'm not the boss of you. You know what I mean? Do your thing. Like Shahid Batar, we get into this argument all the time. I love Shahid. Um, I think that he's a great person and he's like a real activist, like a legitimate in the streets guy. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for that, but he, I mean, as I say all the time, it, here's the thing with electoral politics, uh, you're playing a rig system by their rules and they can change those rules whenever they want to. You're not ever going to win. Um, and just, I mean, like with, uh, Jeff Young, I think is the candidate's yep. name you just asked about. If he somehow miraculously manages to get elected in his district in Kentucky, one of two things is going to happen. They will either get him to capitulate to the corruption or they will find a way to force him out. That's it. That's the, uh, that's it. Um, and look at Cynthia McKinney. That's a great example of somebody that they did exactly that to. And that's, that will be uh, every single time. That's what they will do. Um, so I just don't think that that's a worthwhile effort. I think it's a lot, it's a waste of time, money, energy, resources uh, to try to play a rigged game uh, by rules that can change whenever they feel like changing them. Um, so yes, I support, um, you know, a people's movement outside the system, organizing outside the system, uh, building robust mutual aid networks, um, you know, uh, trying to figure out, uh, you know, different alternative or, uh, you know, kind of parallel systems that we can organize. Uh, and really, honestly, and this is going to sound very cynical and doom and gloom, but just uh, preparing and bracing ourselves for the collapse, because I think it's inevitable at this point. Uh, the United States is an empire in decline. I don't think it's salvageable. Uh, and it's going to be, unfortunately, it's going to be incredibly painful, and a lot of people are going to suffer. Um, so I just think that at this point, we now just have to kind of try our very best uh, to prepare ourselves and our neighbors, build community, uh, go outside, talk to your neighbors, have conversations with your neighbors. Um, that's so critical right now. We're going to need each other. Nobody's coming to save us. No, we can't depend on politicians. We can't depend on Elon Musk. Uh, nobody's, it's going to, we, we have to have each other. Um, and I think that that is going to, uh, again, uh, entail having conversations with people we don't agree with, uh, building coalitions where we can find common ground. Um, you know, all of those things I think is, uh, you know, uh, the, where we have to focus all of our energy and all of our effort because uh, we're very quickly running out of time to do that. And I think that any, for me personally, any energy spent uh, on electoral politics right now is just taking away from those very necessary efforts trying to get ourselves ready. So I don't know if I answered everything in that, but. Uh, I? No, I mean, that, that was a, that was a good answer. I mean, uh, I just, I didn't want to say, uh, I think it's, it's kind of ironic because, you know, the, the whole pitch of social media is supposed to be bringing people together. I think that it really has been a tool just to drive people apart and get us mm -hmm. to hate our neighbor or hate our family member, not, not talk to our family member because they voted for Trump or Biden. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, and also how to deal with the propaganda. Yeah. Um, it, that's a, that's a hard one. Uh, they're very good. They're very effective. They control all of the systems of information. Uh, so the only things that we can do is just while we still have the ability to speak, do so. Share people's work. Uh, that helps to get around the algorithm. So if you see, like, if you see a video from Primo, share it. If you see a video from uh, Jimmy Dore, share it. If you see uh, an article from Alan McLeod or you know whatever, sharing that stuff helps. Um, and not just sharing it on social media. Also share it with your friends and your family. Send it on email. Uh, you know have these conversations. I think one of the like uh, most effective ways that they've managed to keep power and control is by convincing us that we shouldn't have conversations about politics. We absolutely should have conversations about politics. Everything is political. Um, and uh, it, yeah, so I think getting around propaganda is, I mean, one, that's why I do what I do, because I feel like that is the front line. Uh, the, the, the fight against propaganda, the fight against narrative management, to me, that's the front line for everything else that we're fighting for, uh, because we can't affect 
effectively have those fights. We can't effectively combat things if we aren't even able to spread uh, and, and share information. So, I mean, that's, that is exactly why I'm hyper-focused on uh, the stuff that I do. So uh, last patron question says, hello, please ask her about the illusory truth effect and how that should or could change one's opinion on free speech and absolutism. So uh, first off, I guess, are you familiar with the illusory truth effect? I think I've heard of it, but I, I it, it I basically know. means uh, like, it basically means like repeating something until people oh. believe it. So, um, okay. Yeah. What was the question again? So what the, and what the effect of, I, I think I can understand on how that, sh that could change one's opinion on free speech absolutism. So perhaps the question is like, if you oh, have okay. I think, free speech, yeah. you could repeat things that aren't true. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, um, but it, who decides what's true? You know what I mean? That's, that's to me, that's always the kicker is who decides what's true. And so, yes, people can repeat things and repeat things and repeat things to, to the point where, I mean, Russiagate's a great example of yep. that. They were able to that's push That's what came to mind for me. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, that they were able to, at the top of their lungs for years, they re regurgitated that nonsense and a lot of people believed in it. Um, but to me, I think that the answer to that is not to, um, uh, uh make it not allowable for people to say those things to me i just think we need to uh, have a system that is more open to um uh, uh alternative uh, uh opinions i mean as of right now in in the mainstream media and the way that they're able to use the illusory truth effect um is uh they, they have a, a monopoly on information they're the only ones that are speaking or the i mean Obviously, they're the only ones that have the pla like a big enough platform, and they are very good about keeping, um, you know, altering or differing opinions outside of the 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 norm, outside of the kind of uh, mainstream sphere. Um, so yeah, I don't, I I I am not okay with um, saying that the, you know nobody should be able to have like just repeat things. Um, I just think that we need to start working towards a system where it's uh, a lot easier for us to um, have those disagreements, to have alternative viewpoints, to have those different opinions um in the broader conversation because right now it's you're only hearing the one side like right now i mean russia is a great example the russia ukraine stuff we're only hearing one side they completely wiped out an entire network <laughs> just like rt's done they just shut it down and like removed it from the internet um and uh you know it, it uh, it, I would be, it's not that I'm okay with propaganda or the United States lying to its population, um, but it, I would much rather have a more robust dialogue than to silence people. Mm. Well, Misty, I really do appreciate you being on the show today and yeah. talking about always these different topics. For folks out there who would like to follow you and who would like to uh, get involved with the action and support of Julian Assange, how can they do that? Okay, so um, I'm not really all that concerned about people following me. Getting involved in Julian Assange, I mean, I guess you, if you want to follow me uh, at Sarkaz and Stardust on Twitter, I do tweet a lot about different things that you can do to help the the, the cause. Um, but there are a, a ton of things that you can do. Um, and it, it, there's a place for everybody. I say it all the time. Action for Assange is post-partisan. I don't care who you are. I don't care what party you voted for. I don't care what ism you subscribe to, what books you've read. Doesn't matter to me. If you want to fight to free Julian Assange and fight for the future of press freedom and free speech, then you're on my team for that. And I, that's it, period. I don't know why that's controversial, but it is. Um, so we welcome everybody and everybody has a place um, and everybody can do something. You can make phone calls, send emails, uh, tweet about it, really just sharing the information and um, having, and I realized that the Julian Assange case is very complex. It can be a bit overwhelming um, because there is a lot. It's a lot, uh, but you don't have to be an expert. You really do not. There is a ton of resources out there um, where you, if somebody, if you're in a conversation with somebody and they have, you know, they say, they ask a question or whatever, you don't have to always know the answer there, but there are resources out there um, that you can uh, start to educate yourself. Um, but really just getting the legit legitimate information out is so helpful. Um, so having conversations with your friends and family, sharing the information online, um, you can hang up flyers in your local neighborhood. Uh, that's how Action for Assange got started. Andrew really just started hanging up flyers in his, in his neighborhood. Um, and then it just kind of uh, snowballed from there. I mean, all you need to be like a one person protest is a poster board, a Sharpie and a sidewalk. 
Um, and you can go and, you know, spend a couple hours uh, just raising awareness uh, for the situation that we're in right now. So uh, yeah, you can, again, if you want to uh, check out the vigils, we're going to be on every Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, so we'll have different calls to actions there. We'll be interviewing a bunch of different people uh, that are involved in the Assange case. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's really the, the most important thing I think is just getting the information out. We're up against a major media blackout um, and a really well-oiled propaganda campaign. Uh, they, it, it, I think it's it's fascinating to go back and look at the the amount of time and resources and energy that has been spent over the past, you know, 10, 12 years destroying the character of one man. <laughs> like mm. they have really, really gone after him, um, which I think speaks to his, uh, you know, the how effective he has been. So um, it just it, combating the misinformation, getting the information out there, I think is a huge thing. Um, so, and if you want to organize in your local area, um, I've been uh, for the past few years, I've been doing kind of like a matchmaker thing uh, where if you want to organize but you don't want to organize alone let me know what area you're from uh and i'll put it out on twitter and i've been able to get different people hooked up and uh with different groups and because uh, we, we need people in the streets as primo said like we need people it's going to take mass public pressure and the best way to do that is to get people active and engaged outside being loud um so yeah i mean whatever you can do i'm and, and most assange supporters are very open if you want to get involved and you don't know how just hit us up i will help you however you need help I don't care if you want to organize an event and you need help figuring out how to do that stuff, we will help you. We have a guy that makes graphics. We have Alex who uh, combines all those things, all the events globally and puts them out on Twitter um, under a cohesive uh, kind of uh, 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 image or whatever. So yeah, I mean, just it, however people can get involved, please do. Um, you don't have to be obsessive like me. <laughs> It's not necessary. Uh, it'd be cool if you were. I would like to have some more crazy friends who are obsessed, but um, it's not necessary. But we do just need more people at least talking about it, at least openly engaging in the conversation. Uh, and we need a lot of pressure, too. We need to start putting pressure on politicians, in particular ones that uh, could potentially be allies. Rand Paul's a great example right now. I've been on his ass. Uh, he's been talking a lot about free speech and won't breathe a word of Julian Assange, uh, which is very frustrating. His dad's a, a big supporter and has been for a long time. Uh, so the fact that he, Rand Paul, is not speaking about Julian Assange while he's proclaiming to care about free speech is very frustrating. So uh, we need to start pressuring people like that to do the right thing and speak out. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I mean, really about it. We have a, if you want to check out my Twitter, um, my pinned tweet is a, a thread of different phone numbers you can call. Um, we're starting to pressure Amnesty International because they have yet to designate Julian Assange as a prisoner of conscience, which is absurd. Oh. Um, so we're starting to pressure them on that. Uh, and you can also call Priti Patel, who's the UK Home Secretary. The decision's on her as of right now. You can call the White House. You can call the Department of Justice. Plenty of things you can do. Um, uh, so yeah, just whatever you can do, please do. Please do. Please. I'm begging. This is me begging. <laughs> please. <laughs> Well, Misty, I really do appreciate you being on the show today and yeah. hopefully I can have you back again sometime soon. I would love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks again, folks, for watching. To see the full one-hour interview, please head over to rockfin.com slash primoradical and become a premium member. Not only will you get access to this episode of Uncensored, but you'll also get access to a new episode of Uncensored each and every week.